we would like to welcome Brainchip Inc. to the third session of their delivery. We've been very fortunate to be part of the University AI Accelerator Program at Arizona State University. And together uh, we, with the students, we welcome Todd Vieira, the Director of Customer Engagements, and Nikunj Kotecha uh, from Machine Learning Solutions Architect. And uh, today we're going to have a specific uh, session on hardware and any additional questions the students may have. Uh, may I welcome uh, Nikunj and Todd. Thank you, Katina. Uh, I want to welcome the rest of the students to the third session we're having here with ASU on our uh, university program. Today, well, we're going to go over uh, the third lecture, which we're going to, as uh, Katina said, we're talking about hardware. We're going to talk about chip design and trade-offs. We're also going to talk about the scalability and benefits of uh, Akita. And then finally, we're going to talk about one-shot one -shot learning. It's really important to know that uh, when we talk about hardware and software, today it makes a very big impact on knowing at least some things on both sides. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a little bit of information about hardware um, plays a role in today's design, even if you're on the software side, you really need to know a little bit. So um, here we go. I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard of Gordon Moore and Moore's Law. So essentially, uh, Gordon Moore was uh, one of the founders and a key engineer at Intel. And essentially what he said was, you know, the number of transistors incorporated on a design will approximately double every 24 months due to manufacturing and technology um, innovation. And the key thing here, if you look, you look at this picture below, that's kind of what has led us from these old time cell phones that were, you know, basically just a feature phone you could call out, it was very analog to the essentially smartphones of today. You know, many of you have have these, but, uh, you know, it, it's interesting that he said over 24 months and we're actually seeing it even progress faster than that, somewhere between 18 and 24 months. So I don't know if you guys know much about manufacturing, but there's several key manufacturers that produce chips. A lot of the designs today get designed from a architectural standpoint, Verilog, uh, coding, you know, the chip implementation. And those are really software implementations of the technology. That technology then gets shipped off to a manufacturer and they take that uh, information and manufacture a chip. So this is showing TSMC, which is the largest manufacturer of designs today, stands for Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. And if you look back in the 80s, um, essentially they were at three micron technology. Now that, not, that might not mean much to you, but just think about it as the size of a transistor being three microns to do a function. And now today in 20, you know, 2021, we're actually down at four and three nanometer processes. So by reducing the technology allows me to put more chips in a certain area at the lower technology, I get more and more um, efficient. So um, I, I think there's a question here that's talking about uh, Moore's law continuing to progress. It, you're right, it does not seem possible to continue on, but they do, um, you know, they do think of different ways and different manufacturers to get better. But at some point it has to stop because I think the wavelength of light is actually three nanometers. Now, one, one interesting thing on this, um, back in, you know, 0 0.18, 0 0.13, when they're talking about those technologies, they're talking about the size of the transistor. And I think it was around, um, you know, 65 nanometer or lower, um, maybe 28. They started just calling it smaller 
geometries, but they aren't really necessarily the size of the transistor anymore. They're thinking of new ways um, to make these transistors, and it's not just on a horizontal plane, it's on a, um, a vertical plane as well when they talk about fin bets and other things they're doing. I don't want to get too much into that, but the, the, the key thing is, is technology is figuring out a way to uh, extend Moore's law, but at some point in time, it will be um, not being able to to keep up with the the actual physics of the devices. So um, there's a lot of information here. I really only want to talk about a couple of things, and and the first one is about wafer cost. So a wafer is how they manufacture chips today. They're in cylindrical disk and each disk is sliced into almost a cd looking device and the cost for each one of these wafers that tsmc that's all they produce is just wafers you give them the uh instructions on what they're making and they manufacture it very efficient so if you can look at uh it shows technology node 90 down to five nanometer the cost of the wafer is going up extremely high so when you're doing a uh, five nanometer design that's seventeen thousand dollars a wafer okay and that's a fixed cost generally so no matter how many components you get on a wafer that wafer cost is fixed and if you take a look at the uh, slide on the right hand side um mostly just for reference there's two types of wafer sizes. You have uh, 12 inch and eight inch wafers. So prior to 90 nanometer, they were all in eight inch wafers and now they're 12 inch wafers. So imagine a, uh, you know, a, a vinyl record, which is about 12 inches. That's how big the wafers are today. And the manufacturing process is actually, uh, you know, able to make these devices. And as you can see, the 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 wafer doesn't change size so the smaller the device on the wafer the more chips i can fit on that wafer and that chip has a fit i mean that wafer has a fixed cost so it's actually uh you know nice to get a smaller but depending on how much stuff you're trying to put in your chip um you know it's a you know a key part of it and uh, let me let me see you had a couple questions let's say way yeah so um there there are different ways that they're doing both I'm, I'm sure on the ai side as well as the manufacturing the machines and taking into account there's a lot of people at you know tsmc intel and all these different foundries that are trying to think of ways to scale the instrumentations that are making these designs and I don't want to go into, you know, there's a lot of information of how wafers get made, but I really want to, you know, focus on the economics and why um, it's important to really understand that. So as with wafer costs that are going higher, okay, that's only one piece of the puzzle that's the manufacturing side of how I'm implementing the chip. Okay, there are so many other components such as um the qualification how i'm architecting it how i'm verifying it what kind of software and resources i need to write my application software around it i got a prototype and then a prototype as well so as you can see as i go lower and lower in technology the complexity of the devices become more and more complex because from remember moore's law I'm not only going down in size to make it faster, they're adding more and more components on each one of um, the chips that are coming out today. So where, you know, where you're 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you might've had, uh, you know, 10,000 to 100,000 components on a chip. You have billions of components on a chip now and, and just how they all get interconnected together and everything talks, it is truly, a system on a chip today for a lot of the complex uh, designs that are coming out now. See right here, the Apple M1, 114 billion transistors, just amazing 
how much complexity it is. So you can see, just think about how much software code to, to manufacture that, how much test code and validation code that has to be, you know, integrated into that chip to make sure that when you manufacture, everything works and functions exactly like it was designed. So getting back to Akita and RIP at BrainShip, you know, so, you know, I'm trying to kind of bring it back down to Akita and our AI engine. So if you take a look at our AI engine, we talk about nodes, okay? And we use node as our nomenclature to say there are four neural process engines within one node. And each node has its own act compute memory, okay? What does that mean? If you're, if you're familiar with traditional um, chip design, usually there's a CPU, and they have an SRAM in the upper right-hand corner. And that architecture, you run a command on um, a CPU, and then it has to read and write and go to memory and you know back and forth. You got all this bus traffic you have to manage. And with 114 billion you know, chips on the Apple you know, system, that's a lot of traffic. So when we build our compute engine, we try and have what we call app compute memory. So we're trying to reduce that traffic that is on that chip so that the application software can run applications on the CPU and the neural engine will basically do all the math functions very efficiently and minimize that bus traffic on the chip. So taking a look at this uh, top picture that shows from a logical point, um, what are architecture looks like for a single node. I got one MPU and all its memory associated with it. Now memory is, is a very uh, dense and large component of an AI engine. And each one of these 100 kilobytes on each one of these MPUs takes up two thirds of the physical area. So if I look at the second slide, it says physical with memories, those blue, blocks are the actual memory components within the de design that I'm actually writing and reading to to store my weights and activation. And then if you look at the bottom one, that has all the logic integrated into our block. So I have this, the MPU and its memory all local. And what we do is we actually take those blocks of nodes and we compile that depending on the use case and the functions that you're gonna be implementing from the machine learning side. And we determine how many nodes we need to process um, the networks that you're building, okay? And each one of these networks will have so much compute for power and efficiency and performance. And these are the three areas that we're always trying to weigh what helps more and what costs more because these are the trade-offs you have to make when you're determining your architecture and how you're going to attack a problem in the real world. Because as you saw the, uh, the dollar amounts on the wafers and the design times, all this comes into consideration. And the nice thing about our architecture, because it is tiled, so I, you know, this diagram on the right shows 16 nodes. I can have anywhere from two to 128 nodes to implement my AI algorithms. And depending on which customer you have, which constraints that they're trying to fit in, and how they're trying to market their products will determine how many physical resources I have available on the uh, on the uh, AI side for the hardware. So this is a, a recap of our slide when we're talking about our AI IP and our flexible solution. It is technology independent. So even though you have 
four MPUs in memory. Our particular design is at 28 nanometers. As I shrink down that same architecture, and if our, ours is at TSMC 28, and I go to a TSMC 12 nanometer, I basically get approximately two to three X more area savings for the same compute process. Okay. And I also have different flexibility in how I configure my memories. And that'll also play into um, consideration when I'm either trying to be performance uh, efficient or I'm uh, or I'm power efficient. So, you know, um, I have a question here. It's like, what are the most hungry node snappers? Wake word would be smallish. Yes. Image recognition. Yes. As you get more and more vision, vision is a is a highly compute intensive um, application, especially as I get uh, um, higher and higher uh, uh what am i trying to say because higher and higher pixels that i'm trying to look at resolution. resolution right and so what's happening in the industry you got to think about this from two to three aspects okay one aspect is there's all these sensors whether they're camera sensors or vision sensors or um taste smell heat sensors vision by far take up you know a lot of space just because i'm transmitting a lot of data and doing compute on a lot of number of pixels so what's you're trying what you're starting to see in the industry as i get closer to the sensor and send a, instead of sending a let's say a 4k image over to my next chip that's basically doing the image processing what I might want to do is have a small two node network that it knows it's looking for something. So instead of doing processing and sending all that data over to the controller or image sensor processor, now I'm only looking for a region of interest of the exact data I'm looking at. And then I only send that data over to my image sensor processor to do a more com complex convolutions at the next level because um right now there is so much data think about this streaming from the sensor to the image sensor processor to the end device or the central control unit of the system all the way to the cloud and if i'm sending redundant information all the way up and back that's a lot of bandwidth that i'm gobbling up that 95 percent of it is irrelevant and so what we're trying to see is, um, you know, the sensor people are trying to send more relevant data to the next chip that's processing that data for a more complex algorithm that only sends that metadata, metadata up to the cloud that says, okay, I found a person, now what do you want to do with it? This is the question. Do we know when the chip starts to get stressed for 128 nodes? Um, well, so we have, and we're going to go over this a little bit um, on the next slide when we talk about uh, what we, or in the next few slides when we talk about multipath, because these are things that you'll need to take into consideration as our, our architecture uh, helps out with that. And I'll go over over that as well. Um, let's see. Wow. Let's see if I get. So with Akita, we have a very unique function in here called multipass processing. And what this means is instead of running my whole network on 128 nodes, and let's just say, for example, it takes 128 nodes to bring in all the weights and activations and do that, you know, complex um, math functions to get it all done. I can break it up into chunks. And let's say instead of running one pass through 128 nodes, I can actually break it up into four chunks and run it into 32 bit chunks or 32 chunks each for each MPU to handle that amount of bandwidth and reuse the engine to do more computation, therefore saving area. When you save area, you save cost. And if I have to bring in 
all the weights for 128 bits, if I break it up into four chunks, I'm still bringing in the same amount of data. I'm just doing it four times. And each time, I'm only taking 25% of the bandwidth. So I'm not even using, you know, the latency remains the same. And this is a real key differentiator in our technology. So as you can see, instead of having, you know, as you use for 128 nodes, we use an example of four nodes, but I can actually run four passes of a single node. And this will be dependent on the use case and the models and all the weights and parameters you're trying to bring in. But it's an essential part of the architecture as we move forward, you know, in your, uh, you know, classes with trying to build some models. So what I'm going to show here is here, here's an example of multipass. And as you can see on the left hand side, I have seven nodes available to run this uh, mobile net V1 application at 192 by 192 resolution. So I can fit that whole network on here and I can run it in a single pass. Okay, but let's say there's some limitations on the area that uh, this customer has and they only have um, one third the area that is necessary to put an AI engine. Well, what we can do is now instead of running all, what is that, 15 layers in one pass, I'm gonna break it up where I'm gonna run, run it on two nodes and I'm gonna run four passes, each using a limited number of compute engines or MPUs for a handful of layers. So as you can see on the top first pass, I'm only running three layers that's taken seven MPUs. On the second pass, I'm actually running, uh, what's that, two, five layers, six layers, and it's using a total of eight MPUs. On the third pass, I'm using five MPUs through four layers. And on the last pass, I'm running five MPUs through two layers. And this allows me to uh, be highly efficient, both in area and give some adaptability for the use cases and the constraints you may have on the edge on an edge-based device. So when I'm talking edge-based device, you know, in, in the cloud, if you're talking about server farms like a uh, Amazon server farm, Facebook server farm, any one of these data centers, these guys have racks and racks of compute, racks and racks of memory, tons of processing power. But if I'm talking about a doorbell or even a sensor on a car or thermostats or carbon monoxide detectors or dishwashers, I don't have that much compute. So I may be constrained by the physical area and cost of my chip to be in that market. Yeah, I think that uh, for everybody, uh, there was a question from Sai. Do we use embedded C programming to develop this kind of multiprocessing on the chip? So I think I've already responded, but just for everyone's reference, um, this is true uh, in terms of you know the development purposes. So MeraTF is is a platform that you know is a toolkit that will allow um, or define uh, the given configuration, and then we have this Akira engine library that also um you know supports so when you save these models and when you load it on a, onto a particular platform uh, while you reconfigure the ip um you know it, it, it kind of configures itself in in these different chunks so that the hardware uh, can leverage uh its design uh to to enable this multi-pass processing so yes during reconfiguration time you do need to provide some you know, how do you want this processing to be uh, able? But once the processing is started, uh, software does not play any roles in it. It's just the hardware who's making these calls and, and fetching the weights um, going from each chunk to the next. So for example, if it's on pass one, once it's done processing for pass one, the hardware makes, uh, knows where the memory is within the system, uh, fetches the weights for that chunk, uh, and then reconfigures itself, begins the processing, 
right from the outputs of pass one so that way you are you know i i hope you can like connect these dots together on what todd was showing you guys earlier in terms of what goes in this chip design uh what is the cost associated with it what is the trade-off so when you design these chips or when you design an architecture you also have to think around from a business aspect as well i mean if if a if a you know let's say if an end user wanted to use the same application and if we didn't have this multi-pass approach we would effectively be requiring seven nodes um, to run this application now imagine from a business that standpoint how much cost um, would that take because you would be taking a lot more area compared to a two node um, chip design right so that affects cost directly and you may not have a cutting edge product um, within the industry if if that becomes a huge issue for your customers so you gotta when you design these architectures not only just the fundamentals are unique but you also have to think around what are some basic principles that um, everybody looks for? Everybody looks for cost. Everybody looks for area size. Everybody looks for the, all these constraints like power, performances, and how can you support this multiple different avenues um, so that your end user can select the right design choice um, at, at the end of the day, right? And you also have to enable that with a lot of software around it, a lot of toolkits around it, you know, such as MeraTF that allows your end user to kind of view it customize it the way they like it and then before they make any decisions they can really um simulate um the performances that they uh, they would potentially look for yeah the first thing people normally look at is accuracy and they go oh I got 90 percent accuracy accuracy and then they go to power and area and those are the two trade-offs that you have to look at depending on what your spec is for that device and you're always going to have a spec they need to be so many frames per second or so low a power and those two are always fighting against each other you know always and those are the trade-offs you have to make and with our tool you can kind of get a first pass look at what is a power optimized version of this and then you can go in and with once you have the hardware you can see how many MPUs it's taken and how it splits them up in, in our MetaTF. And then you can make some judgment. But this gives you a physical thought process of the things you have to go through because being on the software machine learning side, you don't necessarily think about this stuff as you're developing um, your, your, your solution. So, and finally, you know, you know, just doing some quick trade-offs. I, I have this uh, website I go to. It's uh, anysilicon.com and basically goes over cost and area trade-offs. And what you're going to see, there's, you're going to know approximately how big of a die you have for, you know, whatever chip you're doing. And you're going to have the height and width. And then what it's going to look at it's going to look at based on either a 12 inch wafer or an 8 inch wafer how many die per component you get so you can actually look at how big is my chip going to be how big my ai portion is going to be and then you can do some what if trade-offs to see how many die i get per wafer and if you go back to that first one that's rough estimates on wafer cost you can figure out what your manufacturing cost of that system will be and how much you can reduce the area to get in line with who's ever specking out the cost of that product. So um, just a nice little thing I play with on, um, you know, width and height are pretty straightforward. The scribe lines are basically those blank spots in between the chips that when they cut it up, um, you're going to lose some some wafer material, and those those chips will be four by four with a hundred uh, micron scribe line in between, and that basically just gives you some rough estimates on how many die per wafer you're going to get. And like I said, I use this all the time. On uh, you know, and you can you you'll find out different technologies. Your 
die will be so big. And as you get smaller and smaller, they're adding more components and you figure out those costs as they rise. So hopefully this wasn't uh, too far outside the norm. This is what I wanted to kind of um, give you on the hardware side. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Nakunj and he's gonna talk about one-shot learning and some other aspects of this um, lecture here. Yeah, actually, um, Katina, do you want to take a break at this time? Because um, we just talked about the chip design and trade-offs. And I, what I'll be going is... Awesome. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so what I'll be going over is one-shot learning. Um, as I mentioned in the previous section, we learned about chip design, some trade-offs, some constraints, and the, how, how you design an architecture um, to make sure we can adhere um, to business aspects as well. Uh, now, so one more aspect to this is learning at the edge. So when you design these systems for the edge, you you understand the requirements in terms of features, right? So um, there's a lot of demand in having learning capabilities at the edge, and they want to do it on the chip. They want to do it locally so that all the data is secured um you know it's it's private it's not going to the cloud now this brings in two things data privacy and reduce cost as well because now this you you reduce the amount of cost of training of maintaining these huge servers um you know and 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 let's say you don't have internet connectivity bandwidth connectivity all these costs are reduced not only from the end user side but also the um you know manufacturer side as well so one such feature is one shot learning that we have enabled. And just to give you a quick demonstration, um, you know, what it is and how this basically functions. Uh, hold on, let me just play it, the video out here. So what this is doing is the model is deployed on at the edge and it's basically running uh, it's a mobile-led model uh, which is trained on ImageNet database. So it doesn't have all these beer bottles um, within this data set. So as you can see, we're learning all these bottles on the fly. So we're just labeling them as we as we go from one bottle to the other. Um, this is cool because we're just learning beer on the fly. We've also tasted beer. Uh, so uh, anyway, so coming back to this demo, we have Premiere Learn, we have Light Learn, and all the learning is done right. Now, when we go in inference mode, we bring these bottles back in, and it's able to go through all the different classifications, and it's able to just classify all of that on the fly. So this is something unique and can be applied for numerous applications. Now, over here, when you put in Premiere and Light, it's struggling a lot because it's very similar, but you know the labels are a little different. In this case, you could add another shot. So think of it as augmenting an image, giving another type of sample. So that it learns, okay, the differences, the exact differences between the two bottles. Now in this Premiere and Light, we, we learn Premiere for one shot, we learn Light for two shots, and it was able to correctly recognize between the two bottles and is able to classify um, between the two bottles as well. So this type of applications is, you know, today is highly used for device personalization where imagine if you have a device authenticated to a users, for example, only Todd and I can use it. So as a device comes in house, we learn ourselves on the device and now only we both can kind of authenticate that device, right? Now people are also using these devices out in the field um, to collect uh, let's say individual data and they don't have internet connectivity and they want to do some analytics on this, maybe recognize different types of birds or just only collect data coming from birds or um, let's say they are um, night animals or you know lion, tiger, so on and so forth. So you can really use for those applications. In the industrial applications, uh, imagine uh, there's a there's there's a lot of um objects coming on a conveyor belt and then tomorrow the business adds a new product in line they can quickly learn that project that product and recognize that also on the conveyor belt maybe it's used for counting purposes maybe it's used for segregating purposes 
nevertheless you're using this learning feature and and doing it on the device right and not going back to the cloud thereby reducing the cost of development for that particular user as well so there's a question in the chat what is the fps um so this is happening in real time so when you do learning um it's it's lightning fast because you're only providing one sample and i'll go over the details on what is exactly happening on the chip but you're essentially um doing a feed forward operation and you're just shifting the weights as the sample is being learned within the network so it's a really fast process and it's only done over one sample so it's a very very robust and lightning fast process as well and, and remember this one i think we're about 20 fps around there for our chip our chips run in 300 megahertz at 28 nanometer so as you go lower and lower in technology for the same process you actually increase performance so as the performance goes up you get faster fps and these are all the trade-offs that you know when you're designing for you'll be saying i need 30 fps i need 60 i mean i may need 10. it all depends on the market segments you're going after and the requirements that they're set forth so I, I showed you this with an RGB. Now this can be applied to even audio domain if you have certain keywords. For example, let's say your device is recognizing, you know, it's an iPhone, it recognizes Siri. And you want to custom your own keyword, let's say I want to call it Hakuna Matata. It, you can apply all these features, make your product more cutting edge, uh, more unique and robust from uh, different uh, products as well. Uh, such use case now can be also applied to different sensors, uh, vibration sensors. Uh, right now, this is an event-based sensor. So what we did is we hooked up an event-based sensor such as a prophecy camera or a DVS camera. And what we're able to do is learn new types of gestures, and then the model will be able to uh, go ahead and classify amongst them. So let me play this video for you. Um, so it becomes a lot more clear. So event-based sensors basically recognizes changes in events. Okay, so any any anytime a dis anytime it sees a moving object, it basically spikes and produces a lot of events. So as you see right now, what he's doing is waving, right? So we just learned the wave rec uh, gesture out there. Right now, in this gesture, he's punching. So there is a model that takes in all these events on our processor and then is able to learn these different types of gestures in time and we are able to also classify amongst them so right now he's just going through all different gestures that he would like to learn he learned wave punch and namaste so now when he goes to an inference mode and going through all different gestures the model is now in an inference mode it's able to classify amongst the three types of gestures as we see and notice how the latency for every prediction is about three milliseconds in this case, and the dynamic power that is being consumed is under a milliwatt, right? So that's that's really, really fast and really, really low in power consumption. And again, can be used in industrial applications, automotive applications, let's say it's an in-cabin, and you have gestures flying around your car to kind of uh, maintain or change the, uh, you know entertainment systems in the vehicle or air conditioning or anything that really assists the driver a lot in just doing a lot um more out there and it's it these type of applications seem fit the best fit on akira because we are also an event-based processor so we can really take those events into our processor directly and start applying um the model inferencing the model uh, on our processor yeah, and, and I think it's really cool that, you know, we are doing this in hardware on the fly. There's no retraining in the cloud doing all that. So it's real time live training on a small function um, data set that you're trying to do for what we call device personalization. Yeah, so um, hopefully by, by these two videos, you're again able to connect these dots, right? How how you design an architecture and start understanding the real world problems out there and just ha designing your hardware and adding these features like learning on the chip 
uh, to make sure that it really respects the business aspects of it while also advancing in in, tech, in technology as well. So I'll just go over, um, you know, for you folks out there who are designing and building models, how how can we do that with MeraTF and how can we do that today with um, the dev kits that we have provided? So just going over some examples, these are for, you know, the machine learning guys and software guys who are building models. So potentially what we can do is once you have an optimized model that you're deploying on the chip, you can either introduce new classes over an already existing learned classes so that you can learn these new types of classes, or you can completely destroy um, you know, these original classes and just have the ability to potentially learn new classes. So as you can see, we are essentially playing with the last layer of a model, which does classification primarily. And so you can really um, change the way it behaves, eh? whether you want additional classes to learn or whether you just want the new classes to be learned on the edge. And you can apply this approach to any given model, right? It, it doesn't necessarily have to be the models that we provide on MetaTF. You can even apply it to your own custom models. I know last time you guys were discussing some projects around temperature and using those sensors. Um, so you can, when you develop these models, for example, it maybe it's a regression based model that, uh, that classifies different levels of temperature. You can potentially up add this um, edge learning model to it where it would be able to learn a different segmentation of a, of a, of a temperature, right? Maybe there's an anomaly that's going around and you can learn that anomaly on the device as well. So it's really unique in, in that sense. So just going over two different types of cases, as I mentioned, one case is you're just building this model for new classes. So in order to do that, first step is obviously you train and optimize this model um, your regular way using a CNN to SNN conversion. So you trained it, it's trained on original classes. The next step what you do is you, you remove the last layer that has the weights for the original classes, replace it with our edge layer while compiling um, for two of its parameters, which is number of weights and number of neurons. And I'll go over that section in, in fewer slides. But essentially you are optimizing on those two parameters for this last last layer. Once you've done that with, once you've replaced it with our edge layer, you can save this model and start learning new classes on the chip. It's that simple to create this particular model and apply one shot learning and on the chip on our development system as well. If you just wanted to have new classes to support. And this is kind of what we do for a lot of our demonstrations here at BrainChip when we're out in the field. We either take ImageNet that has a thousand classes and we wipe it out and it's just we can do anything we want there. Or I think we have a mobile face net that we don't have anything in there. So we use this a lot just because it's the easiest way to get a data set in and, you know, be very versatile no matter what our customers want to look at. We can basically do one-shot learning on anything. Now, the second case is, let's say you, you, you want to learn additional new classes while retaining your original classes. And classical example was, I mentioned the industrial application, right? It, it already has some objects in it. Now we introduce a new product and you want to add that new product, right? So that's where this type of, modeling would be required so in that again uh, you do replace the last layer with our edge layer but what you do is you have to retain the original classes so you you kind of increase the last layer to support the amount of new classes that you want to have and because you replace it with our edge layer you do have to just train that last layer on your original data set so that way the weights that you cut in, that you destroyed by replacing can still be obtained and now you're obtaining it for the edge layer. So once you have done that, you have now the capacity to learn new classes on that last layer. So potentially you can just save this model, load it on the chip, and whenever you want to enable learning, 
you can enable learning and switch between learning process and inferencing process so when you are inferring it will it will be, it'll, it'll start classifying between the original classes that is present along with any new learn classes that you have learned uh, previously uh, you know before the inferencing has begun just to give you another example we had a customer that was doing fruit so they had a fruit data set of six fruits bananas apples oranges strawberries and bananas and they wanted to have edge learning on a handful of new classes so we gave them an edge learning layer that was able to learn another you know three four new classes and that's an example use case for um, what you might need it for so you know, while you're building, you do have to, um, you know, adhere to some constraints because, you know, it's an it's an edge model, right? So uh, it's a very classical constraint, and all of those details, along with the two cases, they're all present on Merit TF under the example section. So I think all the, um, you know, highlighted, uh, underlined stuff will have a, probably a link to it. Um, essentially. So the, the constraint here is, you know, the edge layer has to be a fully connected layer because naturally it's doing classification. What it what is one more unique is it it basically must have binary weights, which, which means either the weights are ones or either they are zeros, and the inputs that it receives to that last layer should also be binary, which means the second to last layer, the outputs that it must produce should be binary outputs so when you design the edge learning model which i mentioned to you over here you have to make sure the second to last layer which is this particular layer out here needs to spit out binary outputs so that way you can really um you know give binary inputs to the edge layer out here and then you know one thing is very classical when you run these um you know edge layers the the potentially fit on our um, engine with using just one NP. But here's what is also unique is, I mentioned you have to optimize for um, number of neurons over here. So essentially, if you realize when you build our CNN models, you typically have one class per neuron. With edge learning, you can potentially have multiple neurons assigned to a single class. So you can either have one neuron, you can have two neurons, you can have 10 neurons. Naturally, when you increase this number of neurons, the size of the last layer increases, you know, uh, respectfully as well. So for example, in this case, I have four classes assigned to one neuron per class. So that the layer will be essentially a, a one by four vector. And its input is basically a 2048 input. So if I look at the size of that layer, it's potentially 2048 by four by one. Now, if I had two neurons per class, the size of that vector would now be four by two, which is one by eight, right? Similarly, even again, the entire size of the layer will be 2048 by four by two. Now, why this is important is because you need to fit this model on the chip right so if you potentially let's say put 100 neurons for one class that means your vector becomes one by 400 that's too large of a vector comparatively against the size that we have today right so there are certain trade-offs that you also need to look for whether when you increase these neurons should be you know should when you optimize this number of neurons you have to check for the loss of the model you have to probably also check for the accuracy as well so these are some trade-offs as for example number of neurons is one even number of weights is one trade-off where you know when i put these weights when i pre-assign these weights what should they be and all of that is again suggested in our tutorials on meta tf as well typically we suggest you know the spikes the events that come out from your second to last layer take probably the median of that and you know take a slightly higher 20 percent higher of that of that medium value 
and that could potentially be your number of weights parameter and you can play with that parameter as as you like and just check how it how it performs in terms of accuracy on your test set or you know the loss on your test set as well so that you're designing a very robust and optimized model that you can deploy it on on our on the chip over there so just to kind of summarize you know hopefully that gives you some um areas of one thing is definitely in order to build a commercial product you need to have these toolkits like meta tf these are software toolkits you need to have other toolkits such as you know our engine library so that the the end user who's using these devices can access gain the benefits and also simulate any kind of performances that they would potentially like if they're scaling down in technology second thing is when you're designing it you need to learn about some constraints some business costs some trade-offs that your end users will be looking for so that when you not only when you design a newer technology you're all also kind of importing some of your older older technology or classical knowledge in and, and enabling uh, the end user um, to reduce cost business cost and also uh, reduce the area size as as Tom mentioned earlier and learning on the edge is kind of a cutting makes your product cutting edge so that's something that is very unique to us we do it on the chip unlike any other accelerator so that really allows um you know your end user to let's say use any level of host any kind of host keep them in lower power cores and efficient cores and just use our processor um to do learning on the edge right and many people out there can't even do learning on the edge uh, even if they have a much powerful host so you really need to, need to think of what you're designing and how you can really leverage your hardware to the best possible um you know uh constraints out there and so once you know or gather all these requirements and the key components that way you can really design an efficient and scalable uh, uh commercial product that you can potentially sell out there in in a uh, huge uh, massive amount yeah and just to you know reiterate all a lot of this information is publicly available i think if you go to the tsmc website and look under technology they have all their processes and you know you have to do a little bit of math what they'll say is hey at 28 and you go to 22 we're 15 percent faster um so much percent um a smaller area and so much you know power we're getting so it's just a matter of doing the calculations from one you know one default number and then you can scale down you know in any technology or up so you know all this information is readily available tsmc is the foundry of choice for i think you know 30 percent of the uh the wafer processing is done there but you know some of the the biggest and best chips are are out in, at tsmc i know qualcomm and and apple and all these guys produce there samsung uses their own process you know but it's all out there right so with that i think we have you know about 15 minutes left katina so um we can take some questions or we can even discuss some projects that you guys have been working on and if, if you want some understanding or some feedback for that uh we can even talk about that thank you so much uh, nikunj and todd uh over to the students for questions i know we have a few uh that have come at me uh through dm uh who would like to go first if we perhaps stop sharing uh the screen oh yeah and... well um just in the consciousness of time and the generosity of brainship I, I think we'll end it there any further questions we can assemble over time maybe in two weeks time and send uh, a few things to nikunj and todd to review if they have a chance uh, but otherwise uh, we look forward to seeing you brainship uh in week 15 for the presentations. Uh, tempering our enthusiasm. I know the students want to produce wonderful things. We have uh, not more than six weeks left, including, of course, Thanksgiving and a few other interruptions uh, where we celebrate. But um, our hope is to at least provide 
materials and presentation format that might be helpful to BrainShip in terms of proof of concept. Uh, and in terms of the prototype, it won't be an end-to-end -end prototype, but bits and pieces uh, that would demonstrate a care platform and how information uh, might be used and, and shared between different kinds of operational scenarios. So with that, uh, a big, 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 huge, invaluable thank you to you both and to Chris and Astasi. I can't tell you the importance of industry connecting with education, particularly at the tertiary sector, even for our non-STEM students who are getting into the domain and getting interested. We thank you both in particular for coming three times. Um, again, as I was sitting back listening to this sort of 101 industry, you know, get into to the swing of things, uh, we can't even articulate how, how critical this is to education. It's one thing for me to get up in front of a classroom and tell students to go through a design process. It's something completely different to have you here uh, when you're interfacing with real world clients that have societal challenges to meet and other problems they're trying to solve. But uh, what an incredible opportunity that this has been for our NSF and RT class and for the other students who have joined us uh, with electives. So with that, um, we'll let you go, Nikunj and uh, Todd, and just thank you so much for everything you've shared with us. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you guys uh, staying through the whole three lectures. I know, you know, it could be long and, and boring, but it seemed like everyone got a lot out of it. And, you know, appreciate your patience and understanding and listening to this technical gibberish for the non-STEM people. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, friends. Likewise. Have a lovely. Thank you so much for all of your um, time. I kind of took me back to my days in the university when we would have guest lectures. Uh, but this was something um, special from my side as well. And uh, I think you guys have a very uh, good team out there and great ideas in terms of projects. And like you said, I view if these become, um, you know, successful uh, and you have some materials to share, please do that. We would probably uh, incorporate that or, or kind of demonstrate on, on some of our pages maybe mm -hmm. and just see how, you know, brilliant you guys are in terms of using Akira and developing these amazing projects out there. Thank you, Nikin. You have a knack for education, so do you, Todd. Uh, it's a gift in, in teaching. Uh, but my ultimate hope is perhaps uh, we have some of our students matriculating through and working for Brainship. If, if they show enough prowess uh, and your attention is piqued, uh, wouldn't that be an incredible opportunity for one or two of our students to, to come through the ranks and, and graduate into a company like Brainship? That, that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and we already have one of you guys. We hired uh, Sai, who you know came from ASU, and he's been here about six months now. So, fantastic! Uh, and it's not our Sai Sandeep, but who knows? You might have two Sais in the future. Um, thank you, friends. Thank you. Have a lovely day uh, wherever you are in California. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Nani Kunj and Todd.